Welcome back to the channel. I apologize for not being more consistent uh, in the past few days, about uh, past couple of weeks, I should say, in getting this posted. Uh, I should have posted a lot sooner about the Silmarillion for one, and two, I should have posted sooner just because. Um, for those of you who are fans of the channel, who've been here before, you know that I'm a fan of Tolkien. For those of you who are uh, new, I'm a fan of Tolkien. Uh, I have read um, a lot of his uh, other works that were po published posthumously, uh, one of the, those being The Silmarillion. Um, I had a friend who likened The Sil Silmarillion to reading a, reading a history textbook, and in some ways that is the case. This, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot to uh, unpack from The Silmarillion. So, uh, the the story I don't I don't know if story is the the right way to uh, uh, talk about this here but <clears throat> the uh, kind of the history of the Silmarillion and um, the further works of of Tolkien are that the Hobbit did really well when it was first published and so the publisher came back to Tolkien and said hey we want you to do a a sequel and he started working on the Silmarillion and um, he took that to the publisher and the publisher said we can't do anything with this we can't publish this and so he went back to the drawing board and um, wrote what would become the Lord of the Rings uh, but that doesn't mean that he completely abandoned the Silmarillion if you are familiar with Tolkien's work you'll know that um, that there were a lot of notes and half-finished stories and ideas and things that that he worked on um, <clears throat> at various points during his life. And uh, his son, Christopher, uh, I don't know if I uh, approve of this or not. It does seem a little bit, you know, exploitative of your father's legacy, but I do appreciate it. Uh, because I've been able to read more of Tolkien's work. So I'm kind of, you know, flopping back and forth here on this. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the Silmarillion tells uh, the history of Middle-earth from its creation through to the second, or through to the end of the Third Age, which is basically um, the end of the Lord of the Rings. Now, it focuses mostly on the f first two ages of the world <clears throat> um, and doesn't really go into detail much on um, the th the third age because the third age is covered in the hobbit and and the lord of the rings so it does touch on those events but it doesn't delve into them very deeply so the silmarillion has five parts and I apologize in advance if I pronounce uh, some of these incorrectly. I tried to make sure that I uh, <clears throat> I looked up the pronunciation and things, but whether or not you know they were written correctly in the pronunciation, I don't know. So the first part is about uh, so we have the creation myth of uh, Middle-earth. Now, uh, the the main god of Middle-earth is Eru Iluvatar, <clears throat> and he created uh, the beings that would then become known as the Ainur, um, and the Ainur became the Val Valar and the Maiar. Um, now, he proposed this music, and he gave it to his to the Ainur, one of which was Melkor. Now, now uh, Melkor in this case is very much equivalent in story to um, the Christian Lucifer. Um, he was one of uh, Iluvatar's uh, main angels, if you will, uh, and he kept trying to corrupt the music that Iluvatar was trying to create. Uh, but Iluvatar being the chief and the, the um, basically being God, uh, was able to uh, thwart Melkor every time he tried to 
wrest the creation uh, of this music from him. At the end of this, um, Arda is created. Now, Arda is the world in which Middle Earth is is situated, and uh, Iluvatar grants to his servants to these these beings, the Ainur, if they want to, they can go down to to uh, they can take on physical forms and go down to Arda, and several of them do. One of whom was Melkor. Now, Melkor, as I said before, um, his main goal in going to Arda was not to help with the creation and the ruling of Arda. His goal in going down to um, Arda was to become the king, the ruler of Arda. It, it was his. That's the way he saw it, and he needed to go down and take power. The rest of the uh, the Ainur who uh, came down to Arda, um, they set themselves in opposition to Melkor to protect it. Um, now, over the course of uh, the first part of the book is a, about this um, situation, uh, and um, they keep trying and Melkor keeps trying to like the 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 Valar and the Maiar keep trying to create things uh create more of the world to to push forward uh creation uh to the time of the elves and men because there are no elves or men yet on on Arda uh and Melkor keeps trying to sabotage those so uh, we uh get into so after they've they've worked and prepared the world for the coming of of the elves and men and and everything else um melkor actually is able to um sway several of the maiar to his side and that's how we get the balrogs and how we get sauron um if you're at all familiar with the history of Middle Earth and things like that, you will know that that not only uh, is Sauron a Maiar, but so is Gandalf. All the wizards that were sent to Middle Earth were were Maiar, so they were. Um, it's it's hard to say exactly where they would fall, uh, because uh, they were almost as gods. Um, the the Valar would be considered like the gods and and maybe demigods uh would be an appropriate uh designation for um for the Maiar, except that demigods usually have the connotation of uh such as applies to say Hercules, for instance, from the Greek mythology, where he was part mortal and part god. Uh, and these were just not quite as elevated as um, the Valar. They're just underneath them. So um, Sauron was quite powerful, and uh, so was Gandalf. But Gandalf chose, uh, as opposed to Sauron, to limit his powers much more so that he was able to, to walk among men and uh, observe and um, aid in... Uh, thwarting Sauron and things like that. Anyway, well, as I said, there's a lot to unpack in Silmarillion. Um, when you get past the kind of the creation myth, um, you get into uh, the, the elves and uh, eventually into the time of man. Um, the vast majority of the book is taken up by uh, the, it's called the Quintus Silmarillion uh, in in that section of the book, and uh, that's the history of the Silmarils. Now, if you're wondering what a Silmaril is, who wouldn't? You're sitting there, this is the Silmarillion, where does that word even come from? The thing is, is that, as I said, the uh, the gods had created the world, and they started uh, had started working on furthering the creation. And one of the things that they did was they built two trees, or they, I said built two trees, they caused two trees to grow. And these trees gave light to um, 
the land of the gods. Now, uh, this coming of light awoke the elves. The elves were then invited by the gods to come live with them because the gods were... The gods were concerned, one, for the elves um, because of Melkor, but they also loved the elves. Um, and they wanted them to be near them. And so they invited them to come live in Valinor, which is where the gods were living. Um, and they had these two trees that, that one was basically the sun and the other was the moon. And uh, they gave light. Well, um, one of the elves, he was a... Um, a creator, a smith, uh, uh, an artisan. His name was Feanor. Feanor, um, by accident, as I recall, created the Silmarils. Uh, and these jewels, they were jewels that he'd created. They captured the light of the trees of Valinor. Now, the, the trees were then destroyed by Melkor. So the light of those trees was lost, um, except in the Silmarils. Now, they were so beautiful that everyone desired them, Melkor included. Melkor steals the, um, steals the Silmarils and kills Feanor's father. Um, he actually uh, did a lot more stuff because there was a whole, they captured him, they put him in prison, uh, they let him out because he feigned being being repentant, but then he started working behind the scenes, and he then steals, steals the Silmarils and goes back to, to um, his fortress in Middle-earth, and um, Feanor is so angry at this, at this betrayal. Um, the, the jewels were, were his um, master work, uh, even though they were created by accident. Um, and he... Uh, he swore an oath that uh, that he would kill basically anyone. He would not stop until the Silmarils were returned to him, and he forced his children to take the same oath that there shouldn't be man or god, mortal or immortal, that stood between him and the Silmarils, and that he would not stop until he until he uh, retrieved them. The problem is, um, not only did the the that group of elves, so the elves at that point in time were, were broken up into, um, four different groups of elves. There, there were the, um, the Vanyar, who were considered the high elves, and then you had the Noldor, who were, I believe they considered them the dark elves. Mm -hmm. I want to say dark, dark elves, but not dark as in like the D&D &D sense of dark elves. It's kind of weird. And then you have the Teleri, who were like, they were the sea-loving elves. They wanted to be near the the water. They they loved the water. And then there were the um, the Sindar elves. The Sindar elves never came to Valinor. Like I said, there's a ton here. There's a ton of of stuff. Um, the book is, I want to say, 365 pages according to this count, and it covers thousands. of uh, of years of history. Um, apparently it's, uh, the, the creation is from wherever till 33,567 years. Um, and then there's the year of the lamps, the year of the, the, which was the, the creation. We don't know how long that took the one, the, the gods came to Arda, that was like 33,000 years, and then you have another 14,000 years, and then you have the first age, which is 590 years, the second age, 3,441 years, and then the third age, which was 3,021 years, and then so you, you have a vast amount of time that's compressed into um, this particular story. Okay, um, what I wanted to touch on... Um, so, as I said before, we have the the vast majority of the book is taken up by this uh, this the history of the Silmarils. Um, the elves go back to Middle Earth. To, the Noldor elves go back to Middle Earth to reclaim the Silmarils from from um, Melkor, who uh, Feanor renamed. He named him Morgoth. So, if you've heard the name Morgoth, that's where it came from. Um, <clears throat> they go back to Middle Earth. 
and uh, because of uh, their their oath, they resolve to to um, recover the Silmarils. Um, one of the things that I that I loved about uh, this particular book is the um, the part about Baron and Luthien. Now, Baron was a man, and he fell in love with Luthien, who was the daughter of um, Thingol and Melian. Now, Thingol was the uh, the ruler of the Sindar elves. Um, he was actually a Noldor elf, if I want to, if I remember correctly. Um, and Melian was a, a Maiar, so she's one of the gods. Um, and they. <clears throat> Uh, ruled over their kingdom, and they had the daughter Luthien. Now, Luthien uh, was the most beautiful um, elf in history kind of thing. And uh, Baron, of course, he saw her, fell in love with her. The thing is, is that Luthien fell in love with him, which was uh, unheard of at this point in time. Uh, and Thingol said, you cannot marry my daughter unless you retrieve a Silmaril from the Iron Crown of Morgoth. And so he sets off to do that. And uh, he actually succeeds and returns with the Silmaril. Um, <clears throat> whereupon, Thingol allows him to marry his daughter. Now, this doesn't mean that Baron, um, his story is uh, necessarily a happy one. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot more that goes on with that. He ends up becoming uh, known as Baron Halfhand because um, part of his hand, um, or it may be his whole hand. Yes, his whole hand. I'm not sure why it was Baron Halfhand. It could be that he only had half the number of hands. Um, I forget. But his his hand gets bitten off by by um, a werewolf. Um, the, the hand happened to be holding a Silmaril at the time that it was bitten off, so the, the uh, werewolf ended up consuming the Silmaril. But he ends up, um, Luthien and he end up together. But Baron, being a man, is fated to die. And Luthien, being an elf, is immortal. Um, so they cannot be together. Uh, that being said, um, it is it does end up being... Um, a good story, uh, kind of a bittersweet one. Anyway, uh, uh, if you are familiar with um, Tolkien, as I recall, um, his and his wife's tombstones have Baron and Luthien on them. Uh, he saw the, them as the the uh, that particular those particular. I don't know how to how exactly to say it. I don't know that his his life was um, as wrought with hardship and suffering as Baron and Luthien, but he saw themselves them as fated to be together, uh, soulmates, what what have you. Um, just to move on from this, um, there's one other thing I wanted to talk about, and that's the fall of Numenor. Um, it's interesting if you go through uh, and you see the history of Middle Earth. Um, <clears throat> Elrond is actually a descendant of Baron and Luthien. Uh, he, uh, let's see, um, so Baron and Luthien had a daughter named Elwing. Um, there was another half-elven uh, hero. His name was Arendil, uh, and he was the son of Tuor and Idril, uh, and they were betrothed. Uh, Elwing then had two children, Elrond and Elros. Now, Elrond, um, being that he and his brother, Elros, were um, the product of, of elves and men, they were allowed to choose their lineage, their heritage. Elrond chose to be an elf, and so he gained immortality. Um, he's also called Elrond half Elf. Uh, Elros, his brother, decided to become a man, and he was the first king of Numenor. So if you if you go through the the descendancy, then um, Elros, the brother of Elrond, was the uh, progenitor 
of um, of Aragorn's line. Um, and so Aragorn is marrying back into his family line uh, by marrying Elrond's daughter. Anyway, um, <clears throat> one of the one of the things about um, the history of Middle Earth that's interesting is that um, prior to the fall of Numenor, um, Middle Earth was flat, and after the fall of Numenor, um, it became a round world. Um, the the destruction of part of the continent and the sinking of um, of uh, the con of of the island of Numenor, um, it it was done to because the humans were deceived by Sauron to attack the gods, and the gods went to Iluvatar and said, "We need we we would like you to to stop this," and so he basically. Uh, moved the land of Amon, where the gods were living, in Valinor. He moved it away so that the men could no longer get to it, and he made the world round. So, eh, interesting. Anyway, I completely enjoyed the Silmarillion. I loved it. It was great. I, I, um, I like... I liked delving more deeply into the history of Middle-earth and finding out more about what he intended, what uh, Tolkien intended. That being said, this has gone on long enough for today. Let me know if you've read the Silmarillion. Let me know what you uh, liked about it, what you didn't like about it, if you liked it at all. Uh, like, subscribe, uh, turn on the notif notifications and all that stuff, and I will see you next week.